Baboons played an important role in Egyptian religion. The Egyptians believed that a baboon's body was a vessel that could be inhabited by the gods. Some of the upper class also kept them as pets. Since baboons were considered sacred, many were mummified and buried first in wooden coffins and later in expensive limestone sarcophagi. Presently, baboons are only found throughout eastern and southern Africa. Baboons live in troops that usually number between 20 and 80 individuals. Females typically give birth every other year, usually to a single infant after a six-month gestation. In the wild, the five different species of baboons can live up to 40 years. Baboons often sleep in cliffs or trees and spend the early part of the morning grooming themselves. They spend about three hours foraging for food in the morning and in the late afternoon. Like man, baboons are omnivorous. Herbivores like antelope, giraffe, and zebra like to graze alongside baboons because the baboon's acute sense of hearing warns them against predators. When water is readily available, baboons drink every day or two, but they can survive for long periods by licking the night dew from their fur. Because the wide open spaces in Africa are becoming inhabited by humans, it's creating a problem for its wildlife. When boundaries are crossed, conflict ensues. This conflict has become particularly intense in the Cape Peninsula in South Africa. Because tourists and animal lovers feed baboons, they have developed a taste for easily acquired food. Food that they can steal quickly would take a troop hours to forage for in the wild. Consequently, baboons are raiding homes, breaking windows, and even going so far as to open car doors in search of food. The carnage that is left leaves the victims so angry that many have resorted to violent means of retaliation. Baboons are often treated as vermin and are shot, run over, or suffer a slow death by being poisoned or caught in snares. Since 1997, Karen Sachs has been informally observing baboons in the wild. She spends long hours looking for signs of the baboons as she calls to them on the Western Cape. Bah! Karen's love of wildlife has inspired her to work toward creating a harmonious coexistence for baboons, vervet monkeys, and humans. Over the years, she has witnessed the problems that baboons face firsthand. While many baboons are killed, others are left orphaned. Karen has worked hard to rehabilitate these victims of human violence, such as her successful experience with Gizmo. Gizmo was a baby orphan that came to me through a woman in Brits who'd found him clinging to his mother's body. I'd never been that close to a baby baboon before, so just seeing him was a real surprise. Um, for about eight months I fostered him as a substitute mother. Gizmo had turned into a very good rehabilitation candidate. He was self-sufficient, he could eat for himself, he was a very confident little baboon. So we went ahead with the rehabilitation. We'd always see baboons from a distance, but being able to interact at such, you know, from so close up, just showed me a completely new world that I didn't know existed. Um, what happened, in fact, was these baboons directed the rehabilitation. There weren't any humans around, other humans around, to tell me what to do, and I'd never done this before, so I followed their lead. After about, um, it was almost 10 days of sitting within an enclosure with Gizmo, with him interacting with each member of the troop on the outside of the enclosure. I slowly let him go out. Um, once I was confident that he would be safe with every individual in the troop. And I'd ca I stayed in the enclosure while he separated from me slowly and began to form bonds with the members in that troop. And when I was confident that one of the females was wanted to adopt him, Dottie, um, one day I, I got out of the enclosure and I drove away and left him with Dottie. And he, of course, screamed because his mother was abandoning him. And, and what Dottie did was she ran up to him and grabbed him and held him to her and ran off to the car to try and get me to stop. To, she was trying to comfort him. 
which was both a very, very sad moment as well as a very, very exciting moment because it meant that the rehabilitation was going in the way I wanted it to. But it was very hard to know that I was betraying someone who was actually my child and I'd had to give up just because we came from different species. Unfortunately, not all baboons can be rehabilitated, such as Karen's experience with Darwin. Darwin is a baboon who was brought to me when he was an orphan. Um, from the minute I saw him, I knew something was wrong and we realized that his back legs didn't have much movement in them. We were hoping that it would be a temporary paralysis, but it didn't turn out that way. And although they improved and his mobility was great, I mean, Darwin could outrun me or any other human, but he couldn't be um, properly rehabilitated back into the wild because he couldn't keep up with the troop. And what happened to Darwin was when he was, soon after his, he was born, his mother was shot when she was sitting in a tree. She fell out the tree and landed on him. And this is how he came to be crippled. Contrast to Gizmo, he wasn't a good rehabilitation candidate and the best place for him to go to was a natural habitat sanctuary, which we tried in every way to make possible. And today he's in a, he's in a sanctuary at Care Centre for the Animal Rehabilitation and Education um, and he's with a female called Tokoloshi who also can't be released back into the wild and we plan to put other baboons with him that also can't be released back into the wild. To learn more about Karen's rehabilitation work with Darwin you can read Life with Darwin by Franja Van Riel and visit the Darwin Primate Group website. I found that the closer I got to the baboons and the more I found out about them, the more I realized how wrongly we humans perceive other primates and probably, you know, other species. Um, because we're also primates, the, the species barrier seems very thin with other primates. It's, their language is accessible. And so I was led into their world in, you know, quite quickly quite easily um, and I found the more I found out about them and how much they are like us the harder it was to accept what humans were doing not that that was ever easy but it it was as if I'd become part of a whole new species and there were times when I felt I had to choose which one to be in because because of this such conflict between the two Karen feels that it's essential to educate the public about baboons, monkeys, and property management. She advises homeowners to ensure that there is nothing to attract baboons onto their properties, to keep doors and windows locked, and keep rubbish secure in baboon-proof bins. If they do come on a person's property, rather than resorting to violence, the owner can spray water at them using a garden hose or bang on a pot. To deter baboons from crop raiding, the best solutions are baboon monitors and electric fences. Conservationalist Jenny Trethewin and her organization Baboon Matters hires trackers who work in teams to locate baboons. By clapping, shouting, and whistling, they work to keep them from residential areas. She has also organized a Walking with Baboons tour, where tourists and residents can observe baboons in their natural habitat and gain an appreciation and respect for these intelligent and entertaining animals. Learning to coexist would benefit both humans and baboons. In spite of obvious differences, baboons are related to us. We share 91% of the same DNA. We also have the same emotional language. Karen believes that by observing the subconscious in baboons, it allows us a glimpse into the psychology of all primates including ourselves.